Good afternoon. My name is Melanie Campbell, President and CEO of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation and convener of the Black Women's Roundtable. I want to welcome you to our Black Women's Roundtable Women of, of Color Policy Series, where we hear from women leaders and experts in technology policy about tech issues that are impacting women and communities of color. Our topic today is tech and the ballot box, how to recognize and combat digital voter suppression. Digital voter suppression has been on the rise since the 2016 elections cycle, election cycle and increased to unprecedented levels during the 2020 election and continues to increase every day. This harmful content is intentionally created to suppress votes, sow distrust in our electoral process, incite violence, and harass marginalized communities. If left unchecked, online trolls, both foreign and domestic, will continue to launch online voter suppression campaigns intended to disenfranchise voters in communities of color through social media, text messages, and robocalls at even greater levels during the ongoing 2020 midterm election cycle that we know uh, this one uh, is a major, major, will have a major impact on our democracy, on our freedom, on our rights, and an opportunity for justice in this country, as well as just around the corner will be the 2024 presidential election. Our mission at the Black Women's Roundtable is to empower underserved communities. This is why we are compelled to respond decisively to combat voter suppression in all its forms in order to protect the right, our right to vote and safeguard our nation's democracy. So today, we will hear from experts who will show us how to recognize digital forms of voter, voter disinformation and what we all can do to combat it. But before we hear from our experts, uh, we have another expert who sits on, in, on the Hill and, that's, and we are honored to introduce, I am honored to introduce Congressman G.K. Butterfield from the great state of North Carolina to share remarks uh, with us about this important issue. Congressman Butterfield. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to speak with you for a few minutes today. It is an honor and pleasure to be joining the Black Women's Roundtable as you discuss such a timely and important topic as recognizing and combating digital voter suppression. I am the Congressman from Eastern North Carolina, G.K. Butterfield. I represent the the first congressional district. I serve as chair of the subcommittee on elections of the Committee on House Administration. The Committee on House Administration and the Subcommittee on Elections have oversight over federal elections, including how voters access their ballot and the information they receive to help them do so. Over the course of this Congress and the prior Congress, the, the election subcommittee has set out to examine all manner of voter suppression tactics from the election procedures we traditionally think of, such as polling place closures and voter registration list purges and long wait lines, voter ID requirements and restrictions on mail-in voting, all the way to emerging threats to voter access, such as misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation, which we now refer to as MDM. The proliferation of MDM is a serious, serious threat to democracy and the free, fair, and equitable access to the ballot every voter, voter is entitled to. Our subcommittee has been shining a spotlight on the threat posed by MDM since before the 2020 election, and it continues to do so. We are holding roundtables and hearings, and the committee has moved legislation to combat the falsehood spread about our electoral process. Just this year, the subcommittee held a roundtable focusing on the impact of election-related MDM on the Spanish-speaking and Latino communities and a hearing on the impact of election-related MDM on communities of color, 
and a hearing on the damage MDM has done to our American democracy. And we will continue. We will continue to shine a spotlight on this issue. Of serious concern is the fact that MDM has been targeted at specific communities, such as African American communities and Latinx communities, to sow division and discourage people from participating in the democratic process. The prolif proliferation of MDM targeted at communities of color seen during the 2016 and 2018 elections continued at an alarming rate during the 2020 election, and it continues to this day. Over the last six months, our subcommittee has heard troubling testimony about how MDM has been weaponized and targeted at communities of color by racist and anti-democratic actors who seek to intimidate voters of color and discourage them from participating in the democratic process. Voters of color are targeted with disinformation narratives specifically designed to appeal to each community's concerns in ways that will alienate voters and suppress turnout. My friends, we cannot allow this to happen. We've heard testimony about how, while social media companies struggle to address disinformation in English, their ability to address it in languages other than English is worse. And fact-checking on sites with public-facing uh, posts in languages other than English lags significantly behind English language disinformation. And so MDM is not only deceitful, it is dangerous. Falsehoods spread about the 2020 election led to a violent attempted insurrection on the Capitol grounds and an attack on the country's peaceful transfer power. To this day, a significant number of Americans continue to believe they believe the lie that the election was stolen. And there's every indication that these attacks will persist through the 2022 election. Voters deserve truthful, accurate information about when and how to cast their ballots and truthful information about and from uh, those that represent them. This Congress, in this very Congress, the House passed the For the People Act. We also passed the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act. Each measure contained provisions to combat the spread of mis- and disinformation in our elections, but each has unfortunately stalled in the Senate. At this year's, as this year's elections draw ever closer, we must remember that the right to vote is one of our most sacred rights in this country. As a Congress and as a nation, we cannot, we must not tolerate any voter suppression or discrimination. We must all work together to combat the spread of MDM. I want to thank you for your friendship and thank you so, so very much for having me today and for your focus, your laser focus on this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you again, Congressman uh, Butterfield. Thank you for your leadership. As we know, you work diligently every day as chair of the House Subcommittee on Elections on the, in, on the issue of election disinformation and the impact it is having on Black communities and all communities of color. Thank you again. And so now it is my uh, pleasure to uh, lift up and thank our partners and sponsors of this Black Women's Roundtable Women of Color series. So we thank AARP, the Coca-Cola uh, Foundation, uh, Comcast, NBC Universal. Uh, and I also want to thank our, our media partner, Roland Martin Unfiltered, who's uh, streaming this live. And for those who are watching, please share uh, this information with your a network so folks can tune in and be able to uh, gain some 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 I say tools uh, to fight back against misinformation and disinformation. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, one of our uh, partners, uh, Michelle Hare, Manager, Stakeholder Partnerships, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion from the Coca Cola Company. Michelle. Michelle, I think you're on mute. 
You know, you'd think after two and a half years of working virtually, you wouldn't have to say that we're still on mute. But again, thank you so much, Melanie, for that introduction. And to our audience, I'd like to extend a warm greeting on behalf of the Coca-Cola company. Um, you know, up until uh, 2017, I was a resident of New York State. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. I lived in Rochester, New York, and also lived in New York City for 10 years. And not once did I ever have incomplete or no information about the voting process, and never did I wait in line more than five minutes to vote. Now that I am a resident of Georgia, I've had different experiences, and I know I'm not alone. While it's unfortunate that we have to host today's discussion, I am so incredibly grateful to work for a company that understands the moment and supports such critical conversations as today's. I am grateful to work for a company that confidently stands on its purpose to refresh the world and make a difference. And I'm also super, super grateful for wonderful partners such as NCBCP and Black Women's Roundtable who understand the assignment and work relentlessly to democratize and equalize something as fundamental and as democratic and American uh, as the right to vote. To Melanie Campbell, I want you to know that your friends at Coca-Cola, we see you and we will continue to support your efforts to empower, to engage and educate communities of color and underserved communities so that together we can transform lives. To our panelists and our moderator, I want to wish you big success. I'm looking forward to a robust conversation full of lots of learnings. And as Melanie said, I want to second, you know, what we learned today is only good if we activate it. It's only good if we take it back to our community. So we are all charged with taking these learnings, taking them back so that we can strengthen those around us. Again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this moment. And let's get after it. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you and the Coca-Cola family, uh, Coca-Cola company. Uh, uh, we're looking forward to, uh, you know, making this just this democracy that much stronger. You know, it's, it's some tenuous times, but there have been tenuous times before. And when we come together across sectors like we're doing, I think we will, it'll make all the difference in the world because it's all about inclusion and opportunity for everybody. So thank you. Love you. Appreciate you. Uh, th thank you again, uh, Michelle. We appreciate you all. Um, next, we'll hear from Sean uh, Mickens. Uh, Sean is the Associate Vice President for External Affairs, Comcast, NBC Universal. Sean. Hey. You, hello. Hello. Thank you so much, Melanie. Thank you to you, Jocelyn, and the rest of the team. I must say Comcast is a proud supporter of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation and the Black Women's Roundtable. And we believe in the coalition's mission to encourage full participation of citizens in a barrier-free democracy. To achieve this goal, we believe that all Americans need to have digital equity, the access and the ability to leverage digital skills and technology, mm -hmm. education, civic participation, entrepreneurship, and everyday life. That's why Comcast is investing a billion dollars over the next 10 years to help further close the digital divide. These are commitments that will impact near as many as 50 million Americans over the next decade. This $1 billion commitment will include investments in a number of critical areas, including additional support for our ongoing Lift Zone initiative, which has established Wi-Fi connected safe spaces in over a thousand plus communities nationwide, um, since 2021, new laptops and com computer donations, grants for nonprofit community organizations to create opportunities for low income Americans, particularly in media, arts, technology and entrepreneurship and continued investment in our landmark program, Internet Essentials, which provides, uh, provides internet access for low income Americans throughout the country. 
As everyone has said, today's discussion is, is a timely one as we prepare for the midterm elections in the fall. We all know how important voting rights and fair elections are to our democracy. And we at Comcast are proud to continue supporting NCBCP and the Black Women's Roundtable as they continue to convene leaders to discuss these critical issues of voting rights, technology, and our democracy. Once again, I would love to like to thank you, Melanie, as well as Jocelyn and the team for all of your hard work and your leadership in this area. I look forward to continuing our partnership over the coming years, as well as many of the partners who will be participating on today's panel. And I hope that everyone enjoys today's discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. And looking forward to continue on our partnership and catching up off the box really, really soon. Thank Absolutely. you so much. And now uh, it is my pleasure to turn this uh, technology policy webinar uh, series over to our leader of our technology policy work at the National Coalition and of uh, the Black Women's Roundtable to our illustrious Jocelyn and Tate, our senior technology policy advisor for the National Coalition and Black Women's Roundtable, Jocelyn. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. And I am so glad to be here to talk about this important topic today because, as everyone said, it's very timely. So today we'll hear from experts about how digital voter suppression is impacting communities of color, how to recognize digital voter suppression, and what we can do as voters to combat it. Combat it. So let me introduce uh, to the audience our panelists for today. They are Jenny Liu, Disinformation and Misinformation Policy Manager at Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Shireen Mitchell, she's the founder of Digital Sister and the Stop Digital Voter Suppression Project. Claudia uh, Ruiz, she's the Policy Analyst at Unidos US. And Adonde Washington, she's the Digital Justice Associate Counsel at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today for this discussion. And so I wanna start out really um, with you, Jenny, Claudia, and Adane. Adane, Adane. Um, what impact is digital voter suppression having right now during this current midterm election? What do you see going on in the Asian communities, the Latinx, Latinx communities, and the African-American communities? And um, Jenny, we'll start with you. Hi, um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to say thank you again to all of our partners for putting this together and really looking forward to um, the conversation. But yeah, um, so in regards to the effects of digital voter suppression on the Asian American community, um, so in the 2020 election, Asian Americans actually saw a record turnout, but with the impacts of digital voter suppression, this progress is really threatened. So these tactics are really undermining the faith of Asian American voters in elections and discouraging um, these individuals from going out to the polls. So right as a result, we've seen that a growing subset of the Asian American community and a lot of individuals who are first generation immigrants for whom English is a second language question uh, the very integrity of the electoral processes in this country and a lot of whom are genuinely believe that the 2020 presidential election was stolen um, by Donald Trump. So unfortunately, right, we've seen this time and time, time again in a time where the political influence of Asian Americans is growing and it's attempts of bad actors to take it away. Okay, um, Claudia, what about the Latinx community? Yeah, and again, thanks so much for having me. Really happy to be part of this discussion. And thanks to all my co-panelists as well. I have a feeling we're gonna be uh, seconding and agreeing a lot of each other's points. Um, so when it comes to Latino communities in particular, I think, um, you know, the 2020, we learned a lot and 2020 definitely gives us a kind of preview of what we can expect when it comes to sort of coordinated misinformation and disinformation campaigns um, that target specific communities. Um, I think regardless of community, there are kind of, there kind of tend to be four big buckets of types of misinformation and disinformation. And those fall into misinformation around the issues that matter most to voters. So for example, right now polling indicates that top, the top issue right now for Latino voters is the issue of rising costs and inflation. 
Um, so we can probably expect to see a lot of misinformation specifically around that issue targeting Latinos. Um, the next sort of bucket tends to be parties, right? So uh, characterizing parties um, in certain ways that tend to be misleading or false. So during the 2020 election, we saw a lot of uh, connections being made between the Democratic Party um, and the history of socialism um, that a lot of Latinos um, historically and culturally um, have a little bit of baggage and trauma from. And so those vulnerabilities tend to be exploited when it comes to describing different political parties in certain terms. Um, the third bucket um, is sort of about the candidates themselves. So again, using 2020 as an example, we saw a lot of misinformation, disinformation related to uh, now President Biden's um, health, his mental capacity, his own ties to sort of social, socialistic or left-leaning um, actors and public officials. Again, kind of keeping in line with the same sort of misinformation we saw when it came to describing different political parties. Um, and the fourth bucket is sort of um, what I would say is like the catch all when it comes to just sort of democratic norms and the election process. Um, so misinformation, like Jenny said, uh, related to um, how the process works, especially during 2020 with the transition to mail in voting, um, ways in which online registration can work um, is another really big um, area where we can expect to see a lot of misinformation continue. Um, and then, of course, to kind of round it out on the flip side is that Latinos themselves also tend to be the subject of misinformation, disinformation narratives themselves. So, for example, um, character or falsely ex inflating the number of undocumented immigrants that actually fraudulently vote, even though there's, you know, uh, evidence proves that there's that the, the um, instances of fraudulent voting is nearly non-existent. Um, we can also see this have real world effects, for example, um, in the El Paso massacre that happened um, a couple of years back, right? The um, the shooter there used a lot of the, the rhetoric um, that other, that, that uh, public officials and leaders in Texas themselves would use, not only in their sort of campaign ads, but even in their regular day-to-day -day rhetoric, using terms of invasion, uh, referring to people crossing the border, um, these kinds of things. And um, uh, Adane, what do you see going on in the current midterm election in the African-American community? Yes. Um, first, I'll just echo thanks, as my other panelists have done so already. Um, and Claudia put it perfectly, we will be seconding and agreeing a lot. There are a lot of trends that tend to, um, trends and tactics that tend to run amongst all different um, ethnicities and racial groups uh, as it relates to misinformation and disinformation. Um, the buckets that she mentioned are really important to understanding how these communities are targeted. Um, African-American communities have readily been targeted uh, online um, by vo uh, robocalls and text messages that include misinformation, different disinformation, and just genuine scare tactics as it relates to, um, you know, the notion that African-Americans are worried about the police presence at polling stations, um, the concerns around um, COVID vaccines, which came up uh, in the 2020 elections, and the possibility that if you went to vote or if you mailed in your ballot, um, you would have, you'd be subject to a mandatory COVID-19 va vaccine um, and providing this information could potentially, you know, put you at risk. And so a lot of those are similar kind of trends that we are seeing still. Um, another big trend that we are seeing is kind of the changing of rhetoric around the big lie um, and the stolen election. Um, and that rhetoric uh, is dangerous because it's being marketed in, in different ways to try and, um, you know, undermine the processes um, and the election in general. So as uh, African-American voters are going to their social media platforms, they're oftentimes seeing different things that will dissuade them from just the democratic process in general um, and voting in general. Um, and a lot of it is uh, false narratives that come from what we're seeing uh, as the Voting Rights uh, Act is attacked and as we're seeing uh, different redistricting um, and different um, you know, voting laws passed in various states, uh, African-Americans are often uh, the taking the brunt of that and uh, have concerns around actually partaking in the democratic process. Um, additionally, uh, the spread of the disinformation and misinformation is rampant on online platforms, on social media, be it by pictures, um, and tweets that I think are going to be shared as part of our discussion here. Um, and we can kind of discuss further what that looks like and the best way to handle that. Thank you so much. Now, let me turn to you, Shireen. Your organization released a report in 2018. It was called How the Facebook Ads That Target Voters Center on Black American Culture, 
uh, voter suppression was the end game. And then again, in 2020, you did a follow up to that report that was entitled Digital Voter Suppression, a Key Influence in the 2020 Elections. Now, in both of those reports, you recognize the impact of digital voter suppression uh, and how it was affecting our, our national elections, particularly how digital voter suppression was targeting black voters. What were specific, specific findings in those reports that have uh, changed or are staying the same even now? Thank you for having me, Joyce Lynn. I have been a proud member of the Black Women's Roundtable, and I'm so thankful that we can have this conversation. So I appreciate you inviting me and sharing our reports. Uh, as you can see behind us, we, behind me, I have a couple of conversations that we work on in three buckets, which is disinfo, detox, uh, SOVA, which is Stop Online Violence Against Women, and Stop Digital Vote Suppression. And the reason that we put out that first report was when those 3,500 ads were actually distributed to Congress, uh, there were key conversations that were being had about race being a key component, what Russia was actually doing with those ads, how those ads were impacting how people were voting. What we did was we decided to look at it from um, a digital visual perspective. So in, 28, so in 2018, what we did was we took those same ads, we dumped them into a data uh, a visual, you know, platform and then basically looked at it from a different lens, looking at the, the nodes that were connected, the nodes that weren't. And there was something that was very unique about that. And that was one, uh, in reference to the Black community, that identity was overwhelming the one that was being used both as a weapon against Black voters, as well as a, as a weapon about uh, other groups. And, and how that was being used in reference to that. So once we started looking at that web a little bit closer, we could see some really key points. And one of them was the Latino, the um, Native American uh, web was completely outside. It was not within the same nodes. It was separate. Uh, that, that gave us a key moment. Why would that be outside? The Afro-Latinos exist. So why would the Latino section be separate? There's a reason for that. Some of it's language. There's other reasons that I can we can talk about later, but a lot was already said uh, by those who, who are on the panel with me as well in reference to wh where the connections lie. But what was really distinct was watching the web that was using Black identity and who was being connected to that. So we saw connections to Islam, we saw connections to Texas, we saw connections to gun rights, while all being used on Black identity. And that was the moment that we realized it was not just uh, a racial lens that Russia was working on with their IRA, which is the troll farm. It was a broader context of using identity as a weapon, one to deter and the other to use as a target against other groups. And that is the, the, the crux of what we saw then. And what followed in 2020 was looking at different groups, different campaigns that were specifically used to target Black identity and say, hey, you know, don't vote, period, right? That was a Russian campaign and some people still use it. Now it's changed in different ways in terms of telling people to vote down ballot, don't vote top of the ticket, and all other aspects that we have seen that are part of the same pattern, but sort of extended out. Mm -hmm. So in 2020, we tried to define what the digital vote suppression actually looked like so that people can see it and, and work on it, and especially specifically uh, for campaigns, for any politician that was running, uh, for any group that was trying to get out the vote to, to, to look at the warning signs of what this now looked like and how different it has changed to some extent and how much is, is still the same. They are about key points in our, in our cultural division that our, our identities operate from, but there are also ways in which if you, if you realize that, that some of those groups are outside the web uh, that, I, that I was mentioning, the, the nodes that were outside, is that that also meant that they knew that there were uh, uh, cultural divisions amongst ourselves. And those, those weapons were being used uh, for each of the groups that they had clearly targeted and identified. Thank and you. And I, and I'm sorry. Sorry about that. 
And yes, it's happening. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. I just wanted to point out another thing that you pointed out in your report is the Senate Intelligence Committee report that found that in, uh, was it the 2018 election? I mean, 2016 election? Uh, yeah, there was no single group that was targeted more by disinformation than African Americans. That's a very significant point right there. And um, so, th and this is one reason that we've got to get people to understand, understand, recognize digital voter suppression and know what to do with it when they see it. So I wanna ask this to all of our panelists. Are communities where English is not the dominant language more vulnerable to disinformation and digital voter suppression? And if so, what are their challenges to recognizing and calling out uh, digital voter suppression tactics in these communities? And I'll start with you, Claudia. Yeah, this is actually a really great question. I think it's hard to quantify what's, you know, what's worse or not, but I think that for Latinos in the context of Spanish language misinformation and disinformation specifically, um, there are kind of like unique vulnerabilities that do kind of heighten opportunities um, for Latino voters to be deterred um, or otherwise um, experience undue influence by different misinformation narratives. Um, so I would say the first instance is the idea that particularly for bilingual individuals, right, seeing the same sort of uh, misinformation or disinformation in two languages can really work to reinforce that messaging. Um, I think it's just like very natural that if you see the same thing in two very different places in two languages, it's probably a natural instinct to maybe think that that's something more trustworthy if you've seen it more than one place in more than one language. Um, I think another issue is, right, as much as there's kind of lack of investment and research um, in English language misinformation, disinformation, right, in non in non English languages, it's a fraction of that, right? So it's even smaller investment, even fewer resources to really understanding um, how these trends evolve, like Shireen was mentioning, how they change over time and how at the same time, they sometimes stay the same at their very core. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll end with, um, again, when it comes to Latinos in particular in Spanish language misinformation and disinformation, um, this is something that we heard specifically from some of the major social media platforms was that Spanish language misinformation was a Latin America problem, right? And when they said that, right, what they kind of meant or implied was that, right, their content moderation teams in Spanish speaking countries were the ones responsible for that content. And therefore, what, right, they're falsely equating that all misinformation in Spanish comes in this funnel directly from South and Central America and other Spanish speaking countries. Now, this is, there's a pro this is a problematic statement for a variety of reasons. First is that, right, the United States is home to 41 million Spanish speakers. It is the second largest Spanish speaking population, second only to Mexico. Um, so to discount uh, the United States and homegrown misinformation that happens here in Spanish and also that originates in English but is translated to Spanish, right, completely misses the problem and the ways in which misinformation campaigns really do work. Um, and second of all, as I think it's especially problematic because it also kind of provides cover for platforms to not invest in non-English content moderation. If they're able to kind of pass the buck and kick the can down the road and blame it on their, you know, South America content teams, right, then what they can do is free up, you know, the remainder of their investments to funnel towards, you know, other priorities that they may have that go to ultimately strengthen their bottom line rather than actually uh, protect their users um, when it comes to quality, uh, quality information. That's a very significant point. Uh, let me ask you, Jenny, um, what about the Asian community, Asian American community? Yeah, it's it's definitely, we've definitely kind of seen similar things to what Claudia has mentioned, right? So a big issue is just overall English language proficiency among the Asian American community. So we've seen that one in three, roughly one in three American Asian Americans is actually link, limited English proficient, which means that they speak English less than very well. So overall, right, this definitely makes them more susceptible to general voter suppression tactics because of things like lack, lack of translated voting materials and limited voter contact. And right, all of this coupled together makes our communities more vulnerable to then online digital voter suppression, right? Um, a lot with lack of inoculation with factual information, that, that information void um, leads to greater susceptibility. So as Claudia mentioned, right, language plays such a big factor just because the platforms are so bad, right, at catching non-English disinformation and often kind of treats it as a foreign problem. Um, and another issue with that is that a lot of the times they're outsourcing content moderation efforts to other countries, right? So 
Facebook, for example, a lot of their um, Vietnamese language content monitors are actually in Vietnam and not in the United States. And the issue with that is these individuals may speak Vietnamese, of course, right, but they don't understand the specific cultural nuances or slang that makes it important, that are important in capturing Vietnamese American content, right? So a lot of harmful content that might have been caught is slipping through the cracks. Um, another issue when it comes to Asian Americans, right, is the platforms that they are using to understand and consume political information. So a lot of Asian Americans use encrypted messaging apps like WhatsApp and WeChat that are much harder to flag and monitor and harder for researchers to gain access to than something like Facebook or Twitter. And so in a lot of senses, we don't even understand how big the problem is because a lot of this information and false falsehoods about elections are festering behind the scenes in some capacity. Uh, and then a final thing I'll touch on when it comes to Asian Americans specifically, and one of the challenges that we face in recognizing the issues our community faces when it comes to voting is the model minority myth, right? So oftentimes Asian Americans are painted in broad strokes as like a high achieving, um, very successful monolith. So because of that, it's oftentimes people fail to recognize that our communities also face issues when going out to the ballot box and people are less ready to recognize that that's an issue for us. So because the pl platforms aren't really catching uh, the, the, the voter suppression in the, in the, uh, the non-English speaking uh, communities, it's really, uh, would you say that it's spreading relatively faster in non-English speaking communities than it is um, in general? Yes, definitely. Um, obviously, and it, what's, what makes it difficult, right, is as I mentioned, it's hard to do research when it comes to this just because it's there's so much, especially within the Asian American community, right? So many different languages are covered, so many different platforms. But in the research that is out there, we've definitely seen time and time again, for example, content that is flagged and perhaps taken down in English, right? So for maybe a video about the COVID-19 vaccine and falsehoods there, the exact same video in Chinese or in Vietnamese, for example, will be left up because it slips through the kind of same content moderation, um, either through from the uh, perspective of an algorithm and having, and having it being flagged there or a content monitor catching it on the other end. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's unfortunately very much so an issue. Now, you, you also mentioned that um, platforms like WhatsApp is used uh, a lot in the Asian American community. Claudia, what uh, particular platforms uh, that uh, do uh, the Latinx community use a little bit more, uh, particularly that would uh, cause the, uh, uh, those trolls to target that, those particular platforms more? Yeah, so I'll start by saying is that for Latino communities in particular, um, we tend to trend mobile first. So that means that while um, many Latinos or the majority of Latinos actually lack a home broadband internet connection, they have to rely on smartphones. And what that comes with is sort of an over-reliance on social media um, and media outlets for news and information. Um, so when it comes to Latinos in particular, the three larger, the three sites that they tend to use the most are, um, and I think in this order, YouTube, Instagram and WhatsApp. So I'm actually glad that Jenny brought up WhatsApp. Um, and so these are all in WhatsApp and YouTube in particular present two, um, two kind of platform models that are really hard um, to actually capture, um, label and eliminate a lot of the non-English language um, misinformation and disinformation because of the ways in which they're kind of different than let's say like a single Facebook post or a single ad that's running um, on your Facebook newsfeed, right? For YouTube, it can be a 20 minute long video um, where it has different pieces of misinformation sprinkled within, right? But that is then still allowed to stay up um, despite the fact that it is you know, violating certain um, content policy standards. Um, again, to kind of go back to really quickly Jenny's point about WhatsApp, again, super difficult to sort of, to, since they are encrypted in closed messaging apps, it is really difficult to kind of um, to research and actually monitor the ways in which uh, in misinformation threads within closed WhatsApp channels evolve, disseminate, and then even cross over um, across languages as well. Going back to our earlier discussion about, you know, seeing disinformation in both English and Spanish. Um, now, the other thing about these uh, social media platforms, and this would apply to all of them, um, is the idea that 
right? Platforms are incentivized to push content and to prioritize and deliver content that is divisive, polarizing, and conspiratorial, right? Because what that does is that that keeps the user online. It keeps the user engaged and it gets them to the next click, to the next click, to the next click, right? We've all done the sort of like doom scrolling and like uh, Facebook black hole and how you just lost an hour somehow clicking from one link to another. Um, so right, platforms want you to do that. They want you to stay on. So again, it comes back to the fact that platforms are not necessarily incentivized to actually clean up the content and enforce their own content moderation policies and standards because it would affect how much money they ultimately bring in, their revenue, and so on and so forth. Um, I'll also close with you know using Facebook as an example, as a specific example, is that a lot of these social media platforms, right, in with an eye towards achieving right the, the, and maximizing revenue, they have developed targeting tools that allow advertisers and campaigns themselves to micro-target and deliver different ads. Um, now, of course, some of those uh, policies and tools have been tweaked. Some of them have been withdrawn. Um, but at the end of the day, the reality is that, you know, what made Facebook so successful as a platform for advertisers is the way are the ways in which advertisers are allowed to sort of micro-segment populations and deliver very specific ads, sort of what Tashireen was mentioning in, their, in the report that she wrote um, a couple years back. Yeah. Now, so now that we know what digital voter suppression is and where and how it breeds, let's talk a little bit about how to recognize it. Um, so I want to bring up a couple of, uh, before we go on to the next question, I want to just bring up a couple of uh, some digital uh, uh, voter su suppressive images that have been online and let's just let's just look at those for just a second. So if we can get those up really quickly, and uh, and then we'll go on to another question because I want to ask you, Serene, about these uh, training sessions that you've been conducting. Now, if we look at the these two um, ads, let's kind of um, dissect those a little bit. These were some ads that were in um, the last presidential election, and um, one of them was talking about the polling changes. And then the, uh, the other one is talking about how black people need to stay away from the polls. So um, Shireen or Adane, could you just kind of, you know, talk about the impact these are ha these have had in previous elections on uh, voter turnout um, in the African American community or any of anyone that can uh, chime in on these and let me know what t these type of ads have you seen them having an effect. Um, in previous elections and how, how do you think they're going to be affecting the elections going forward? So um, one of the first ones, Donnie, I want you to just definitely follow up, is there's two dis distinct differences between these two that you put up. One is literally a technical aspect, right? In the sense of telling people the wrong date to vote. That's illegal. That is one of the big ones that happen a lot in terms of the content that goes up. But it also happens to be one of the ones that the platforms will take down because if the date for voting is wrong, they'll they'll take it down because they know that that's the case. The other one is very specific where it's just basically telling black people we have no power in this system. So just don't vote at all and let the system crash, kind of. And that's a very separate one. And it's a little different because it's harder to get platforms to take that second one down. The first one they'll take down. The second one is, quote unquote, an opinion. And that's where we get into very uh, dicey spaces around what digital vote suppression is. Uh, Adani, I see you nodding your head. Please chime in. Yes. Um, and Shireen uh, completely made all the, the correct points about the first one. Um, the platforms, uh, after some after some time, have officially kind of implemented into their policies to ensure that they are monitoring the ones that have the absolute wrong information as it relates to date. Um, and that is a common one. Um, the second one, not only is it problematic because it is an opinion, but it's also using um, a lot of tactics that are, it includes two individuals who are prominent in the Black community um, and that are well known to individuals in the Black community specifically. And so not only are you attaching an opinion, you're also attaching it to 
to um, people that are well known and to some individuals hold a decent amount of weight or authority. Um, and those are the ones that are likely going to be, um, and the thing about tweets, you see them transplanted from Twitter to other platforms, right? So you'll see them pop up on your Facebook feed and they kind of are immortalized um, in, in those spaces. And the ones with opinions are the ones that are often, you know, shared the most or people are sharing them with the, uh, the concept of, oh, this is a public service announcement, PSA, thinking, you know, let me spread this information. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that we can, of course, get into um, a bit further in terms of inoculation as it relates to seeing these false tweets um, and potentially trying to inoculate them or provide the correct information while not also ampl amplifying the inaccurate information. Okay, um, and we see, and I, the first one you said that the the um, the social media. I know that Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube specifically pull down, say that they pull down a uh, uh, blatantly false information about election days. But you see, this one got 154 likes um, before it was pulled down, and who knows how many it, it received uh, before it was actually pulled down. So, in your opinion, um, I would address this to any of you. In your opinion, do you think that the social media sites are acting fast enough um, um, to pull down this information, or what? Things do they need to do better, and and that's open to everybody. If I could take it first, if and I'll I'll be brief so others can jump in. Um, we have seen that Twitter um, and I believe Facebook as well has started to in their algorithmic process add the disclaimers um, to try and and put a disclaimer up like this as it relates to election information. Find the information here potentially before pulling it down. Um, I don't think it's fast enough, um, especially because like you mentioned, it got 154 likes. Um, you know, we've seen other things go go up on social media and come down much faster and still have widespread attention. Um, and so I'll leave that there and pass it to the others. The Don't Vote campaign is actually a Russian interference campaign, by the way, and it's still going. I'm sorry, say it one more time. I didn't hear that. The Don't Vote campaign is Oh, okay. The I Don't Vote, vote. okay. With the hashtag Don't Vote. vote. Mm -hmm. It's still going. It's still going. Yeah. From 2016, it's still happening. So it's going right now during these midterm elections. Yes. Well, let me let me turn to you, Shireen, and ask you. You have been conducting training sessions for quite a while to help people recognize digital voter suppression. Now, in your sessions, what do you tell people to look for uh, to recognize digital voter suppression? So some of the key things that people don't realize that they're like, they think that we're having a debate about um, people's intellect, how smart people are. And I've, that has never been the case. The, the, the challenge that we're faced with is that the things that the campaigns use has to do with people's belief systems and where they sit on uh, in, in politics, how much they understand how it works, how much they don't. Um, and what I try to teach in, in, the, in, uh, in the, in our trainings is that this is not a conversation about trying to have uh, in, in intellectual debate, because then we have people say, well, now you're talking down to me. You're making me, you're, you're talking to me like I, I, I can't, I can't keep up with you. And that becomes one of the weapons used. The other one that I have to keep telling people is pause on anything that gives you a visceral emotional response that you feel compelled just to share it without reading or, 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 or understanding what the tweet or the post or the video or the meme says. Like if that invokes an emotion out of you, pause, take that moment. Those are some of the key things I speak about, but then the other part is about countering and the countering part we're still having a hard time over. And that is trying to get people to understand, like tell, tell a true story, make sure the facts are in check, you can mention the thing that's disinformation, but then you have to close it with the actual facts again. If you leave any parts of that open, you only talk about the disinformation, you're just helping that spread. But the thing is, a counter narrative is very necessary. You cannot do this strategic silence anymore because now we're in an ecosystem of complete disinformation. And most people will use that opinion part as the weapon against facts. And we need to make sure that people understand facts exist. We all have a different opinion, but facts do exist. 
And um, Claudia and Jenny, let me ask you. Um, I know uh, Shireen mentioned, you know, that that when you see something that that uh, sparks your emotion to initially just move and and click and like, are there any particular um, issues or topics or uh, notable people in the Asian or or Latino community that will spark people to just hit that button if you know if disin disinformation is surrounding uh, that particular issue or that person? Yeah, sure. I'll go ahead and kind of tick through a few. Um, and again, these are things that we saw during the 2020 election that we've continued to see right since then. And I think that we can expect to see a real serious ramping up um, as we get closer and closer to the midterms. Um, for Latinos in particular, I think I mentioned this at the top of, uh, of the discussion, um, is that uh, Latinos' history with um, uh, socialism and sort of dictatorial or authoritarian regimes is something that's very sensitive, especially for a lot of immigrants or first generation uh, Latino Americans, right? You have um, a lot of experience in places like Cuba, Venezuela, right, where people simply do not trust the ways in which um, different government regimes have been have run their own elections in their countries, the ways in which the government had the government reach and overreach and government creep. Um, may or may not be mirrored in what's in misinformation narratives that are targeting Latinos today. Um, those sort of trends are a very big hot button issue um, for a lot of the Latino community. Um, another one uh, that tends to have a lot of traction with Latinos is the issue of religion. Um, Latinos tend to be, um, on average, fairly religious. Catholicism is sort of is the prevalent, very dominant religion. However, evangelical Latinos have started to gain a lot of influence and have been growing in numbers as well. Um, so you see a lot of sort of social issues that are really so. For example, the issue of abortion is is, is an example, right? The ways in which religion is used to sort of funnel. Um, and promote misinformation narratives around reproductive freedoms and reproductive rights. I think especially with the most recent overturning of Roe, with the Dobbs Supreme Court decision, that's going to be a massive issue um, going into this midterms, and probably we can see that sustained up until the 2024 elections. Yeah, I can jump in, too. Um, so definitely, I think there are a lot of parallels between the Asian American, what the Asian American community is experiencing and what Claudia just mentioned, right, with a lot of Spanish speaking communities, especially around kind of the exploitation of the traumas experienced by a lot of these individuals among communism and socialism. So we've seen a lot of attempts to tie democratic politicians to socialist or Marxist policies um, back in the fall and earlier last summer when there was all of the kind of mis and disinformation surrounding critical race theory, we saw a lot of attempts to tie that to the Chinese Cultural Revolution and a lot of kind of disingenuous um, efforts on that front. Um, in terms of other kind of tactics that we've seen, there have been some kind of more very explicit attempts to keep Asian Americans away from the poll. So one example that we have in mind is ahead of the 2020 presidential elections, there was a very large push on WeChat um, within dozens of different groups, which are kind of the bread and butter of um, how WeChat works, right? So these large group chats where um, communities will often convene. There were rumors that the DHS was preparing to mobilize the National Guard to quell riots. Of course, in an attempt to keep Chinese Americans away from the polls to scare them out of voting. So, in addition to more kind of explicit, right, kind of the vote, don't go to vote at all tactics, we've also seen a little bit more covert efforts to just broadly undermine faith in elections, electoral politics, and specific candidates. So, kind of similar to the don't vote examples that were shown earlier, right, we see a lot of rhetoric around like, oh, um, politicians don't care about Asian Americans, so why bother voting at all? Or a lot of messaging around questioning the security of elections and sort of discrediting results before votes are even cast, right? Um, questioning the security of vote by mail and things of that nature. Um, and that's that actually has a really interesting tie back to sort of the home country narratives that we've discussed. So in April of 2020, there was a lot of disinformation around mail-in votes with regards to the South Korean midterm elections um, and the idea that that was, of course, falsely marred by mail-in ballot fraud. And so we saw similar narratives bleed into South, um, South Korean American spaces 
during the 2020 presidential elections and similar rhetoric around mail-in ballot fraud. Um, and then one final thing that I'll touch on is messaging that emphasized around the 2020 election, um, the risk of the coronavirus, which of course a lot of Asian Americans were very sensitive to, to scare people from visiting in polling in-person polling locations. And a lot of that was unfortunately targeted at the most vulnerable kind of elderly populations and members of our community. Um, uh, let me ask you this, um, Adani, um, the focus of your work at the Lawyers Committee on Digital Justice, You, in, in your work, you work closely with the Election Protection Project uh, to monitor digital voter suppression activity. Are you seeing any new trends um, any, anything new in the digital voter suppression trends during this midterm election cycle? Um, not anything that is, you know, profoundly new or different necessarily from the 2020 election. Um, but essentially everything that was happening in 2020 is still happening and is still a concern. Um, I know we are heightening our kind of monitoring for um, phone calls, uh, robocalls that come through. Um, one of the cases that we work on um, actually with NCBCP is related to robocalls that went out um, in predominantly Black neighborhoods such as um, in Detroit and in um, New York and Ohio. Uh, and these calls were targeted at uh, individuals in the African-American community to specifically uh, scare them from not only mail-in voting, but also from um, in-person voting. And that was, again, some of the things that I mentioned before as it related to the coronavirus um, and as it relates to kind of a police presence at the polls. Um, and further, text messages have also gone out um, during election cycles, some of them just uh, convey false information, um, and some of them just having kind of sentences that are be weary. Uh, you know, there could be something, there could be police at the, the ballots, or I'm sorry, at the um, polling stations, or just uh, general things that might uh, scare either elderly populations, uh, individuals who are black and brown, um, or otherwise. And that is something that we are monitoring. Um, I know there are other uh, telecom companies that are um, trying to stay on the forefront of paying attention to harmful calls and texts that are going out by these bad actors, um, which is kind of a great step towards uh, preventing and, and hopefully uh, stamping out some of this misinformation. Um, further, in Black communities, we are continuing to push um, at the Lawyers Committee uh, on behalf of the Black and Brown communities, um, the, push the social media companies to do more and be a lot more diligent um, and much faster at the ways in which they are handling and removing misinformation, disinformation, um, we encourage them constantly to put the tags on articles, um, on those tweets and uh, on those Facebook posts that encourage individuals to have that um, correct information. Um, as Shereen mentioned, um, you know, having that counter narrative has become very important. So ensuring that anything that is posted that could be harmful is immediately followed up with here's where you find the correct information or for more information, see the polling and for, you know, go to the direct website for your state or for your county. Um, that is very important at the state level. I think is where a lot of the concern is at the moment, being that um, in these different states, uh, Georgia, of course, is a big one. Michigan um, is, is kind of another one that is concerning at the moment, just in terms of individuals who know that they, during the 2020 election, uh, did a lot of mail-in voting um, and their districts were the ones that were targeted for voter fraud or um, having issues at the ballots and with the mail-in uh, ballot fraud and and kind of all of the things that encompass that are encompassed by the big lie. Um, those are states to be on the lookout for a lot of misinformation and disinformation as it relates to specific state elections um, for the Black and Brown communities. Um, further, I'll just add that, uh, again, the social media platforms is kind of where we spend a lot of time focusing um, to ensure that that information or those platforms are uh, handling the wrong information properly. Um, and we further push the legislators to also push on social media companies um, to, to ask for greater transparency 
transparency in what data that they have as it relates to um, bots that they might be seeing, or even, um, I'm not sure which uh, which one of my fellow panelists mentioned it, um, but the information that is uh, harmful and the information that is um, triggering and kind of, I believe it was Claudia mentioned it, um, the, the information that is polarizing and makes you click forward. And we, if we have more uh, clarity on that information that is on those platforms, um, you know, we can have a stronger push for disabling that harmful information from occurring um, and targeting the individuals who are posting it on the platforms. Uh, you mentioned uh, the information that's going out that's frightening people and scaring people away from the polls. We do have um, a couple of examples of that. And, and while we pull that up and get that on the screen, let me tell you, uh, uh, speaking about the different trends, one trend that we saw here at the Black Women's Roundtable that, were, that uh, was targeting Black voters um, during, the, uh, Black Live, during the height of the Black Lives Matter movement a couple of years ago is that... Um, while they were building social media sites that were first building up followers, uh, promoting the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, celebrating Black people and denouncing police violence. And then as the election started to draw near, um, they started to tell those followers that they had garnered um, uh, not to vote and lift up not participating in voting as something, an honorable thing to be. So that was one of the trends that we saw. But I wanna go back to what you were saying about looking at um, some of this disinformation that is scaring people from the polls. And if you look on the screen right here where you see the bullseye and the gun, this is one uh, particular um, uh, uh, disinformation that was specifically targeted to scare people away from the, the polls. If you think people are gonna be there with uh, sharpshooters are gonna be there, of course you want won't want to go to the polls. So let's just look at these, both of these for uh, just a moment and just kind of um, dissect them a little bit. If you look at the one with Kamala Harris, anybody want to uh, weigh in on that one? Yeah, this, the the Kamala Harris campaign was a big one. And it, it started two weeks before she even announced that she was gonna run for president. And now she's the VP and it's still going. And if you didn't see the report by Box Centennial that showed how often there is content that is literally easy to find and and twitter did not take any of that down and a lot of it's still up in different ways um i'm glad that there's some actions being taken and, and some consent of understanding that the disinformation these memes actually have an impact now but the, this was one of the big ones because she was never a cop and the fact that people could not process that she was never a cop and that we had to have a broader conversation about what it is to be a black person as a cop, what it is to be a black person as a prosecutor, as a attorney general, all the spaces in between and how difficult that the vision can be easily used as a weapon. The, the first one with Kamala, like if you just even look at that, it's just like all the ways her laugh, how often is something about her laugh mentioned? right? That's part of that meme. And that's why that smile, that laugh is there. Because even Black women laughing in, in any kind of joy is used as a weapon as well. It is very much like a very centered, not just on her as a Black person, but, but the whole context that you'll get into about her also being Asian and where that goes. There are so many connections to using her as a weapon in so many uh, ways in, in multiple communities. She is like the perfect example to use her. And then the, the other part is very much um, things we came to understand about um, uh, Black people being uh, threatened, lynched, trying to vote. Like it falls into that other category. And sometimes um, if you actually think about even the COVID example, believe it or not, using COVID to one, get people to not vote, right? Saying if we're sending our elders in to vote with COVID, we're asking our elders to die in the same way that when they stay home, <laughs> which is where the laws are now based on disinformation, if they stay home and mail it in, that somehow their vote won't be counted. So we now are, are using two key things that happens in the black community about how elders will vote no matter what, and what gets used against them in the way that convinces them not to vote. 
And I've seen multiple campaigns use it, but it's very much a key aspect of, of, of if you don't understand the black community enough to understand why that's problematic, you will never be able to stop this. You'll respond to it and let it move and not realize that this should be reported and taken down. The nuances of it is what's missing for people when the bell doesn't go off right away. Cause it's like, oh, well, no big deal. There's so much in that meme alone about Kamala that gets weaponized in multiple ways. And then the, the really quick last point, I just wanna make sure that people can hear this part is that voting is something black people have fought for, our ancestors have fought for, that's what we say. But then in those really key moments when the disinformation is actually used against that, nobody pauses and people should be positive. That's that emotional part that I keep speaking to. And and then too, in the second one, this, 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 this fear, um, that that's put in the ad where um it says in our infiltration of white nationalist wings has allowed us to create a high chance of success plan to train ex-military snipers snipers to commit random killings at early polling polling locations my gosh and and this one had 26 likes and 28 retweets um and who knows how many more before it was taken down and that's the point like that's actually a death threat right and death threats are not protected by the first amendment but somehow people let that go and no one checks it and, and no one reports it and that's the other thing that's problematic with the platforms a lot of it is also bent on the fact that other people have to report something but they have to identify it first exactly and that's why we we really want to to focus to get people to recognize digital voter suppression. So let me turn to Ginny um, and Claudia for a second. What is uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice uh, and UNIDOS doing um, in the community to help voters combat digital voter suppress uh, suppression? And, and I'll start with you first, Jenny. Yeah, so a big thing that we're pushing for with this electoral cycle and previous electoral cycles is just really amplifying accurate in language content about elections. And as we've talked about extensively, right, oftentimes it's this information vacuum that is then filled with problematic information. And especially with regards to this past election, right, with the pandemic, and as we touched on, right, all the influx of changes with regards to polling locations, for example, or mail-in ballots or registering to vote online, there's just a great big opening for bad actors to kind of enter and sow confusion. So we're just trying to minimize that as much as possible, push out the relevant information in all of the relevant languages so that our communities can be inoculated with factual information before inevitably, unfortunately, right, they are subject to the kind of falsehoods that we've been talking about during this panel. Um, and then also working with our community-based partners to amplify good information and also taking care, as we've talked about extensively, right, to not accidentally amplify or give more air to the kinds of falsehoods by um, refuting them. Um, so we often talk about, right, like the truth, the truth sandwich when talking about missing disinformation, like starting with a factual claim, debunking potentially the unfactual, and then ending again with um, a factual statement. So that I think will be the main focus for us um, in this election and, and coming elections. Um, I think for us here at Unidos, um, again, it's having taken so many lessons learned away from the 2020 election, um, we can expect that our uh, voting rights work and voter mobilization work moving forward um, to sort of act as a three-legged stool. Um, so the first leg being, you know, continuing to scale um, and maximize our reach with our um, get out the vote or GOTV work voter mobilization, voter education, um, registering voters, um, that sort of thing. Uh, leg two is sort of the bread and butter uh, uh, policy and advocacy sort of work that we do. So it's, again, making sure that we're uh, pushing back on sort of state level attempts um, to restrict voting um, and making sure that we're getting reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act, um, those sort of things that can actually strengthen and protect the right to vote, which therefore would then translate into making it harder for misinformation and disinformation campaigns to exploit the vulnerabilities um, that come with the lack of voter protection um, that we're starting to see and the rollback of voting rights that we're starting to see at the state level. 
Um, and then the third stool, which you know has now uh, been an outgrowth of necessity and sort of the whole uh, subject of today's conversation, is this this new role of having to really kind of step out as a trusted messenger. Um, and you know, as to Shireen point, Shireen's point earlier about you know misinformation, it requires not just you know uh, fact checking. Um, and demonstrating why information is incorrect, but it requires a counter narrative. It requires positive information that works as inoculation to make sure that misinformation cannot spread from one person to the next um, on the one hand. And second is to also make sure that voters themselves are more educated about what their rights are, what they're entitled to, and what information is in, in fact quality and, and that can be trusted, um, uh, can, that can act as a trusted source of verifiable information. Thanks so much. Now, um, you know, as people are turning more to digital content, and a lot of people are getting all of their information from digital content, so it's really become really critical that people distinguish between uh, credible information and about voting and suppressive information and to know what to do about it. And, and we've talked about different ways um, that people can distinguish it. We've looked at different ways and you, you, we've shared, you know, what people can do. Don't, you know, don't, when you get that urge to, that emotional urge to react by sharing, think, stop and think first. But now let me ask you, um, um, what do you think, and you so you've told us what we can do as voters and what your organizations respectively are helping people to do but um you know, and we heard from congressman butterfield earlier about the for the people act and the freedom to vote um freedom to vote john r lewis act and the provisions that they have in it that would combat uh voter suppression and how both of these bills have passed the house but they're being stalled in the congress but now what other things do you think um outside of those two bills that the government could do um, to um, increase its uh, uh, increase combating voter uh, digital dis uh, disinformation, and and that's open to anyone. I just have to say that government tried, right? We got two things going on. Remember that disinformation board that was supposed to happen? It got disbanded. Why? Because disinformation was also the thing that affected it. We are having. Uh, I, I, I can't remember the outlet. I think it was the Washington Post. But disinformation now is the unspoken thing that we cannot speak about. Anyone using the term, anyone speaking to the term, it's so fascinating to me because the term used to be computational propaganda. We changed the term so everyone can understand it. And now even that term is being used and being weaponized. So any mention of disinformation is now under attack. So we're having a hard time, not because the government isn't trying to take an action in this moment. They've taken actions and we've watched the response that has come every time there's a step towards dismantling the disinformation. The reason for that is that we have to now admit that there are Americans that are participating and using the weaponization of disinformation to garner votes and, 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 and exercise in their campaigns. We need to start saying that part too, because it's not to really foreign anymore. The problem that we have, and this is the problem I've had with, with platforms too, when it's a clear foreign actor, they will take an immediate action because that part's illegal. When it's an American, now we have to have a debate about free speech. Well, then it sounds like what you're saying is we really need a whole of government approach. Um, we need the Department of Justice to use its full prosecutor prosecutorial authority, um, even the, the Federal Trade Commission using its rulemaking authority. So um, it, that's what it sounds like it's saying to me. And, and you know, anyone can chime in on that as well. Are, are we looking at uh, the need for a, a whole of government approach? And, and what do you think is, is going to be necessary to make that happen? I would say that's right. Um, a whole of government approach is going to be necessary. Um, as Shereen mentioned, we've seen uh, we've seen attempts, and they have not proven as fruitful. Um, so it's not always going to be helpful. Um, and as uh, Congressman Butterfield mentioned, you know, 
they have two that are now stalled in the Senate. Um, and so some of that is, you know, continuing to push the mechanisms that government um, has at their disposal, disposal to um, combat what's happening online. Some of that can happen um, with, uh, you know, federal privacy legislation. Some of that can happen um, with movements by the FTC to, to ramp up their efforts to um, handle kind of like civil rights issues and um, other uh, algorithmic issues that occur online that are pushing some of this misinformation and disinformation um, and just putting the pressure on the social media platforms um, as a whole to really take into consideration the harms that are happening, um, especially around um, election disinformation and misinformation. Um, I think Shireen's point about the fact that misinformation and disinformation is kind of changing and how we uh, define it and how it's used, um, you know, used in, in different kind of ways um, is necessary for understanding that it's going to look um, kind of different um, and it's going to take a whole approach for individuals to be, um, you know, educated on what they're looking for, um, how they can spot it. And as Jenny mentioned, the misinformation sandwich and ensuring that, you know, we have that bit of truth with the false information and then following it up um, with that truth afterwards is going to be really necessary. Um, I, I really also want to just emphasize um, a point that's come up kind of in, in some other things that we have mentioned, that in the Black and Brown communities, there is a distrust that has come in with the Democratic process as a whole. And so there's also just this general kind of um, concern that's always existed, but I feel is is continuing to, to gain a lot more traction, a lot more publicly, is that if we vote, you know, it doesn't do anything. And then we see the states that are, that are changing and redistricting um, and kind of taking away the power that is supposed to come with um, with the voting and electoral process and the de democratic process, and that right there, and then you pair it with um, Congress is is not passing, you know, the laws, and we see individual um, senators and representatives who are making statements about things that are really necessary to all of our communities, and, and making these statements as if they are not as a high priority as they should be, especially as it relates to um, the overturning of Roe and um, gun control and, you know, all of the kinds of things that Black and Brown communities are often targeted for negatively. Um, and therefore now the kind of common understanding is, you know, maybe our vote doesn't count. So a lot of what's going to be necessary as we go forth, um, as, as Claudia mentioned in there, uh, in the three-legged stool approach, is a lot of that education and a lot of getting out and telling people, hey, here's how to do this. Here's how to, to access the right information for your state, for federal, for your jurisdiction, whatever it is. Um, that is going to be kind of one of the combined efforts that all communities can take. Uh, and uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and it sounds like all of our organizations have a lot of work to do to make that happen. Now, let's talk about the elephant in the room. What do you think the tech sector should be doing more to combat digital voter suppression? And we'll, uh, well, I'll open up to anyone. <laughs> The, the, the challenge that we have is that the tech sector actually benefits from it, right? It, it, engagement is engagement, even if it's bad engagement. That's they're calculating and, and the triggers that they're using are the numbers, right? It's exactly what you said before, like how many times did that get the, like any of those bad and, and wrong uh, texts or tweets got more traction than it should have. It is the false amplification part that we're still not dealing with. And by the way, the tech companies use that as a measure. That's the data points that they're counting. What is the thing that's getting people to respond? And it is the emotional response. You remember years ago, Facebook had got caught out, called out about like testing uh, emotional uh, weaponization of the news feed, right? That's a benefit. There's another part that we're not saying. They keep using this term that like the tech the tech industry are mostly liberals. No, they're mostly libertarians. There are two differences. And the fact that we cannot have that conversation, they're not trying to protect the liberals. They are benefiting from the fight between and they will use it because it works for them because the data points that they're looking at are not the data points that we're looking at. We're trying to look at the data points that are false 
and trying to remove them. And they're looking at the exact same data points and see engagement. And that is the problem that we're having with the tech companies. Most of us have all had different conversations with the tech companies and have walked away. I had to one time show up to Twitter showing an actual image that was still up since 2016 that said, don't vote with the actual Russian image of don't vote. And it wasn't until I showed someone in their face that they take it down. We are having a fundamental disconnect between not only our political system and how it works and most people not knowing and not understanding and the ways in which the lobbyists from the tech companies are also impacting the politicians who were using the disinformation for votes. Anyone else care to follow that one? Yeah, I think Shireen always makes a great point, which is right. At the end of the day, the platforms are like any under any other industry and that red maximizing revenue is their guiding star. Right. So I think that that's something that we have to absolutely begin from. Um, any discussion has to start from there. Right. And the fact that um, incentive structures are not going to align when it comes to the ways in which they're allowed platforms themselves are kind of allowed to act largely unregulated. Um, and so in the interim without, you know, for example, uh, comprehensive federal privacy, like Adani mentioned, it really is up to the platforms themselves to step up and fill the gaps that they, the gaps to actually provide something that fills the gaps that they themselves have created um, because of their business models and their platform structures. Um, I'll also just add, and I think, um, you know, the idea of maximizing diversity um, and, you know, corporate DEI, diversity and equity and inclusion initiatives, I think kind of get a little bit of like a, or tend to be cast in sort of light touch colors. But the reality is, is that, you know, any industry, any organization, any company, right, it's C-suite, it's um, tech developers, it's software engineers, right, their products are only going to be as diverse and reflective as the, the people that are designing and creating them. So when you have platforms like Google, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, when you look at their employee diversity base and you realize that, you know, the majority, the overwhelming majority are not people of color, are not women, right? You start to understand the fact that how can these products that are supposed to be meant for such a diverse society, such a diverse population, possibly be reflecting that true diversity if such a small, if the if our own participation is limited in their creation. If we are not the people at the table make setting policy decisions, making sure that we're the ones writing the content moderation policies. Um, to Jenny's point earlier, ensuring that content moderators themselves speak the language, the non-English language that they're meant to monitor, but are also under culturally competent in sort of the themes that apply not only from a non-English non perspective, but also from a non-English speaker in America's perspective as well. Um, so I would just kind of end with uh, the plug for maximizing DEI, again, throughout ent the entire sort of uh, corporate structure, all the way up from executive, all the way down to product designers and engineers. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Well, I want to say, I want to thank you all. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I just wanted to jump in and add one additional thing. Um, we're also, we're, we're talking here, I think, mainly about the largest tech companies, um, the one, the Facebooks, the Googles. Um, it should also be noted that there are other social media platforms that were bred out of um, 2020 kind of election and, and slightly right before. So we have, like, Parler is one of the kind of top, um, top ones out there. And these you know, again, they are left to kind of their own devices on how they are setting up what's happening on their platforms and it's up to them. Um, so not only do we wanna push the larger tech companies, we also wanna push for, um, you know, transparency across all the tech platforms um, and all the tech companies that are used to kind of still spread this information. Um, and, and I understand that, you know, they're private and they can kind of operate how they'd like, but uh, that's kind of where that uh, federal, uh, federal privacy legislation comes in where um, states can, you know, implement different sorts of uh, privacy legislation for themselves. But we really need to focus on obviously the larger ones while also paying um, attention to smaller ones that can also be just as harmful. Okay. It, it is all just, uh, I'm just going to jump in right there because it's all the platforms. It's not just the one or two. And like, it's trying to explain to people even the response is, is, is not the kind of response that we're getting, right? Certain people are granted more free speech on these platforms than others, right? We've seen that in the hearing when uh, Hogan 
re reported that Facebook actually had their own reports that 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 the algorithm was 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 treating white people differently than black and brown people. But instead of fixing it, they were like, we're just going to remove the algorithm. Like it, it is that choice. That choice says that protecting black and brown people on the platform was not as important as allowing certain people having their voice, even if their voice was harmful or dehumanizing another group of people. The other piece that I think we're working towards, they took over Facebook, for example, took over CrowdTangle. CrowdTangle is one of the tools that was being used. There was that NYU debate where the re researchers were trying to be able to get access to the pipes so that they can look at the data, report it, acknowledge that something wrong is happening. If you're going to dismantle the tools of which people are trying to solve the problem, then you don't want the problem solved. So now there's like this conversation about like crowd tangle being taken away. That means that once we start going through these political uh, debates and these 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 elections, that that now certain groups of people who were using those tools have to come up with a new way to figure out how to hold the platform accountable. The platforms are saying that one example, I'm using Facebook. Well, we don't want to be held accountable. So we're going to take away the tools for every organization that's working on civil and human rights to hold us accountable. We know it's happening. We have our own reports, but this is our revenue. This is our stream. This is the way that we collect data. This is what works for us. And they're still moving down that line. The fact that we're not having a conversation that Facebook is thinking about taking away CrowdTangle means that we missed the first part, that when NYU was doing that research, collecting that data, that moment was being used to say, well, we're, they're collecting data on people and we should, we, we're protecting everyone's privacy. So why take away crowd tangle in, in entirely then? If that's really your goal. It's trying to make sure that people connect the whole dot in the timeline. And that is the part that I think we're still struggling over. So the, we have the tools. The challenge that we're having is being able to implement the tools. And when, when certain voices who are trying to mitigate the harms are the ones being silenced instead of those inflicting the harms. Great information. And I understand um, that we have some questions from our audience. So we want to take a few of those questions now. Um, if we can get those questions up. Um, we have Felicia Davis here. She wants to know what do we do differently? Should we counterattack? And if so, how do we do that? And that's open to anyone, anyone that wants to answer the question. I think it was repeated a couple of times just in terms of the true sandwich, but it's also, uh, in my opinion, bigger pushes against the platforms as well. Like it's not just the platforms, it's the politicians who are saying yes to what the platforms are doing in a justifiable way. So you're saying we need to push, push it, push the politi push the politicians to act and keep the pressure on on the tech industry as well. Anyone else want to respond? I, I would actually kind of jump in and say that um, you know, it, it's funny, we talk about digital voter suppression. And what is it? If you just eliminate the word digital, it's something we've been contending with, right, for decades, right, at this point. Um, to, I think Shireen's second report, the 2020 updated report, starts with giving a little bit of historical context, right, and talks about how digital voter suppression is just a continuation of all the historic practices that we've seen that disenfranchise minority voters and voters of color. So things like gerrymandered maps, um, the ways in which the census is conducted to, you know, that ultimately ends up undercounting people of color, um, poll taxes, liter literacy tests, right? All of these are old, outdated notions, right, that have been addressed and we've, we've come up with solutions to address those issues. But now what's happening is we're pivoting to making sure to recreating these same sort of effects, but within the digital universe and using digital tools, messaging tools, and so on and so forth. Um, so I would say that it's important to recognize these things, to Shereen's point, 
as voter suppression, as a tax on people's right to vote, as a tax on the, the power, the growing power and influence that we're seeing happening in every single community of color. And I think this goes back to, and I don't think we talked about it um, in too much detail, but Shireen alluded to it at the very beginning of the discussion is that another trend that tends to happen in each of our communities, right, is a lot of racial, exploiting racial tensions. And this is something to use a really concrete example. We saw this happen immediately in the wake of George Floyd's murder, the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, as much as polling reflected the fact that um, Latino and Asian American um, and other communities of color supported the notion of standing in solidarity with the Black community, you could also immediately see uh, different narratives come out that start pinning us against one another, right? Saying, oh, like, as if human and civil rights are a zero sum game, as if if Blacks, if we support Black communities, invest in Black communities, grow um, Black political representation, that somehow takes away from any of the, our other communities, right? And that's something that, ha again, it's a tactic, exploiting these racial tensions is a tactic that has lived at the core of voter suppression tactics since the beginning, right? It's always been an effort to sort of dilute the power and influence of communities of color to ensure that white dominant power power structures remain in place. And as we get closer and closer to becoming a majority minority um, country, right, in the next uh, probably 15, 20 or 25 years or so, right, we're just gonna see a ramping up and a larger scaling of all of these uh, voter suppressive tactics to make sure that power that is in place remains in place and entrenched. Same thing, just wrapped in a new package. That that's all. Uh, can we go to another question? Okay, this question is: uh, How influential are influencers in digital messaging campaigns to debunk the myths? This one is tricky. Um, and I think it's tricky because I see Shereen uh, smiling, so I'm glad we were kind of going in the same direction. Um, it's tricky because influencers, uh, anyone could get an influencer, right? Um, and influencers are often given the information that they are to be sharing with their um, following. And so we see, um, you know, repeatedly we see influencers and celebrities who are on the right side of, you know, passing along uh, quality and really good information about voting. And that is very useful, right? You have um, kind of, as we talked about before with that tweet example, um, people who hold a lot of kind of weight uh, in the black community and in other communities or in each of our communities, um, those individuals, there are a decent number of them who are spreading good information, right? But on the other side of things, there are influencers who are likely going to be brought on to kind of share some of the misinformation and disinformation. Some of that is because not only are they going to be paid to do so, but based on who their following is. We've seen the harmful podcasts. We've seen the harmful um, TikTok accounts who are spreading this information and misinformation um, to their large followings. And then, you know, we'll have... Um, right-wing uh, leaning groups who are getting these influencers to continue to spread this information and misinformation um, in harmful ways to their following. So I think it, it really kind of goes both ways and can be tricky. Um, they are influential um, for good reasons, but they can also be influential for harmful reasons. Um, so I think a lot of that is going to come back to, um, as Shireen, Shireen mentioned, there are opinions and we are all entitled to those opinions, but there will always be facts. And so I say to anyone who is really uh, into their social media um, and, and looking at their accounts and those uh, influencers that they are, you know, stay true to, watch the videos every single week on the YouTube channel, um, do your research after kind of hearing what they've maybe talked about. If you, if it's new information that you maybe didn't know about the election prior to, maybe take a second to kind of look into that a bit further. Um, if it's something that you've always known and now they're presenting a different lens to it or presenting um, something that counter, uh, you know, is counter to what you thought you knew about it, take a second and just Google, look into it. Um, there are lots of, uh, all our organizations are really good at providing um, general kind of election and voting information to the public. Um, and so there are a lot of really good resources, but always do your own kind of fact checking um, when it comes from even people you might trust on your feed. So basically, um, and the answer is for us to do you to do your own due diligence. 
don't rely on the influencers because the influencers can be influenced. So. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> like that, 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 that don't vote image that I was talking about was a boot check person. That's why I stayed up so long. <laughs> like it is, it is that moment of trying to get people to understand that sometimes even the influencers have been influenced. There were people who have blue checks who were celebrities who were sharing some of the Russian content, even, even when not even noticing the logo, like the Russian logo from their, their, their fake black America U S uh, website, right? It's people not even catching that and then immediately sharing it because of the celebrity. So it has to be a combination of understanding both. Thank you, Adani, because I was just like, yeah, <laughs> this one's hard. And it's, and it's hard because you want the trusted influencer to be able to help push a narrative that is helpful. But unfortunately, sometimes that trusted influencer can be influenced. Okay. Um, if I Go if ahead. I can jump, jump in really quick. Yeah. So when it comes to influencers, right, I think oftentimes we think of celebrities or famous people, but... When it comes to what we talked about earlier with um, encrypted messaging apps and right a lot of which a lot of our communities use, a lot of the influencers in those networks are more trusted leaders within the community, right? So church pastor pastors or um, family members, and so people's guards are down when it comes to someone like that sharing information. So I think it's just really important to remember to basically take everything that you see with a to approach everything you see with a healthy degree of skepticism, even if it's someone that you trust sharing something, right? And I think that's what makes, that's a, a big part of the vulnerability of missing disinformation spreading on apps like WeChat and WhatsApp because they're so community focused. And um, a lot of the times people view members of these groups as trusted messengers, right? It's it's often harder for them to discern like what's real and not real because if it's your friend or if it's your mom sharing something, I think you naturally are more susceptible to believe that it's true, even if oftentimes um, that person may not necessarily have the correct information. Now, let me ask you about that. With these encry encrypted, uh, on these encrypted platforms, you said sometimes it could be a leader in the community. Now, do you think that leader in the community is being influenced, uh, you know, or incentivized to spread that information, or they're just spreading information that they heard and they're spreading it along and it's just, and it's just fanning the flat fire. I think in, it depends on the situation. There are definitely, I'm sure, in, in, instances where it is malicious and potentially um, out of a desire for power or oftentimes money, right? But then also there are often instances where it is just, on it, it is misinformation, right? Where the t intent isn't to harm, but it's just people are misinformed and don't have the necessarily the accurate information themselves. And then it kind of um, spirals from there, right? Where it's passed from one person to the next and it isn't necessarily malicious, but the bad information is still is still being perpetuated regardless. Okay, let, um, do we have another question? Okay, well, Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank everyone on the panel today. You've provided us with some wonderful information to help voters to recognize when we're being attacked with digital voter information and what we can do about it. So right now, I want to turn it back over to Melanie to close us out. Melanie. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. I tell you, ladies, Great job, great job. I'm, I'm, this is all of the people in the background. I tell you, Jocelyn, y'all, the, the chats were just going uh, off on the other side on the um, uh, on Facebook. People were really weighing in, and it's really, really one. Thank you, Jocelyn, for taking the lead on pulling this together. And Jenny and Shereen and Adana and Claudia, thank you, ladies, so very much for sharing your expertise. I know this won't be the last time we got to stay connected, y'all, because we know this this fight is real, and and what's happening uh, online is really uh, something that's never stopped. Uh, and our democracy is at a really critical tipping point, and this does matter. And what I saw, uh, as I stated, from people just weighing in, folks needed to hear hear from you all today. So thank you so very much. I want to again also thank the back end team that's helping in the background. 
um, from the NCBCP tech team in the back, uh, and that's Antoinette Minor and uh, Christina Q and our comms team, Angelo Greco and uh, Lauren Walls. Um, and uh, thank all of you all for tuning in. Thank you, Roland Martin Unfiltered for being our media partner and our brother in the movement for always bringing the information that is needed. And lastly, and, and certainly not least, is thank our, par our partners and our sponsors, AARP, Coca-Cola Company, Coca-Cola Foundation, Comcast, NBC, Universal. And again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, look to hear more from the Black Women's Roundtable, Women uh, of Color, tech policy series that will continue on throughout the rest of this year to bring you critical information that impacts not just policy, but really impacts our ability to save our democracy and, to, and so many other things that, that technology impacts really every aspect of our lives these days. So thank you. God bless you and see you soon.